Well, good morning, everybody. And a very warm welcome to any who are visiting with us this morning. It's lovely to have you in church, and I hope that you enjoy uh, our worship together. Our service is that of Morning Prayer 1, which commences page 101 of the Book of Common Prayer. And we start, as usual, with our greeting. The Lord be with you. And, also with you. and a sentence of Scripture. Through Christ, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Our opening hymn is number 519. Come all who look to Christ today. 519. <clears throat> back to our prayer books and continue page 101. Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his spirit, we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. So let us confess our sins to God, our Father. Let us pray. <clears throat> and we say together, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and we humbly weep. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. 
Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. O Lord, open our lips. O oh God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Our first canticle this morning is the Vanity, and we will read this together. The Vanity, bottom of page 103. Oh, come, let us sing. O oh, come, let us sing out to the Lord. Let us shout in triumph to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his face with thanksgiving and cry out to him joyfully in silence. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his and he made it. His hands moulded dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is the Lord our God. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the wilderness when your forefathers tested me. Put me to proof, though they had seen my words. Forty years long I loathed that generation and said, It is a people who err in their hearts, for they do not know my ways, of whom I swore in my wrath that they shall not enter their rest. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Would you please be seated as Ella comes to read our first reading for us this morning. The first reading can be found on page 67 of the Old Testament and is from the book of Exodus chapter 16 beginning at the second verse. The whole congregation of Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pot and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of Israelites, They looked towards the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses and said, I have heard complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight ye shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then shall I know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the word of the Lord. I have God. Thank you very much, Ella. 
turn back to our prayer books for our psalm, which is Psalm number 78, which you can find on page 681. And we read from verse 23 to verse 29, as usual by alternate half verse. So Psalm 78, page 681, beginning at verse 23. So he commanded the clouds above. He rained down upon them manna to eat. So mortals ate the bread of angels. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens. He rained flesh upon them as thick as dust. He let it fall in the midst of their camp. So they ate and were well filled. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please be seated for our New Testament reading? The New Testament reading is from John chapter 6, beginning at verse 24. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, You are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second canticle is Benedictus on page 107. Would you please stand? And we will read this together. Blessed be the Lord. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. The Lord has raised up for us a mighty Saviour, born of the house of his servant David. Through the holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of those who hate us, to show mercy to our forebears and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hand of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous before him all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins, In the tender compassion of our God, 
The dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. We continue to affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed on page 112. I believe in God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We turn back now to our hymn books for our next hymn, which is number 661. Through the night of doubt and sorrow, onward goes the pilgrim band. 661. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. O Lord, save the King. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness. O Lord, save your people. Give peace in our time, O Lord. O God, make clean our hearts within us. And the collect, the special prayer for this, the tenth Sunday after Trinity. Let your merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, and that they may obtain their petitions. Make them to ask such things as shall please you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray that your Holy Spirit may so guide and govern us that in all the cares and occupations of our daily life we may never forget your presence, but may remember that we are always walking in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Forgive us, Lord Jesus, for so often being content with the second best in our spiritual lives. Thank you that you are the bread of life and for your promise that he who comes to you will never go hungry. From now on, give us this bread and help us day by day to feed on him and so to live forever. Amen. And in our diocesan cycle of prayer this morning, we pray for the parish of Milltown, for the rector, Geoffrey Walmsley, for parish readers, Stuart Brennan, Christine Walmsley, and Sam Strait. And in our diocese, we pray for chaplains who serve in the hospitals, in the hospices, and in prisons. And we pray for and give thanks for the leadership of Archbishop John McDowell. So Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we give you thanks, our Father, that as you sent your Son, Jesus, into the world, so he has sent us, has given us his word, and prays that you will protect us from the evil one. May we have our gift of sure confidence in all he has done for us, so that we may be enabled in the face of all evil to stand our ground, and after we have done everything, to be found still standing through the full armour of God and through the grace by which it is given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And gracious God, as your Son, our Saviour, for our sake made himself nothing and became obedient to death, help us to care less for ourselves and more for the interests of others. For the sake of his name that is above every name, that holy name of Jesus. Amen. And here in your house, O God, we pray for one another. Give us each on the blessing we need. We ask for your healing for the sick, your strength for the tempted, and your joy for the downcast. And Lord, answer the prayers which we try to put into words and the prayers which you read in our hearts according to your perfect love made known in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. And we worship you, we praise you, we declare our love for you, our God, because of your gift 
of the new life of faith. We thank you for the new peace we have with you through our Lord Jesus Christ, who, when we were powerless, died for the ungodly. We thank you for our new access to you in your majesty and holiness and for the grace in which you have enabled us now to stand. We thank you for our new hope of your glory and for the joy it gives even when we suffer. So Lord God, we adore you for your love poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit given to us and for the reconciliation we have received through Jesus Christ our Lord, who died for us and is alive forevermore. Amen. And we sum up our prayers and we pray for each other in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. We're going to sing our next hymn, which is number 555. Hymn number 555. <laughs> of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I wonder this morning how many of you had toast for breakfast? Anybody have toast for breakfast this morning? Whatever. Yes, there's one or two. Lovely. I had porridge. I had a bowl of porridge. I haven't had toast and breakfast since I think the last time I was on holiday somewhere. But maybe those of you who didn't put their hands up for having toast, maybe you went one further and you had a, a piece of fried bread with some sausages and some lovely bacon and perhaps top that all off with a lovely fried egg where the yolk was still lovely and runny. Oh, it would make you hungry even thinking about it. But you know something? The humble loaf of bread is something that we all take for granted 
because we're so used to it and it is so readily available. And I wonder if perhaps sometime this week some of you will maybe take a trip to Tesco's or Sainsbury's or to Super Value or some of the other places and you'll walk along the shelves and there's the bread, you'll lift out a loaf of bread and the decision you're going to have to make, will I have a plain loaf or pan loaf, will it be thick cut, medium cut, thin cut, will it have grains and it will be malt, will it be sourdough, what is it going to be? And you know something, I'm quite sure none of us realise that the cost of the, the packaging around that loaf of bread actually costs more than the flour that went into making it. Something to think about. But for most of us, we'll just, we'll just go and buy whatever bread we like, and it won't be a particularly eventful trip. But you will be wrong if you think that. You will be wrong. It is quite difficult, I think, for us to understand the importance of bread unless we turn on our television and watch what is going on in so many places around the world today. When the essential things of life are not available, there is suffering and there is famine. A simple loaf of bread, something which we probably don't even give a second thought about in certain places in the world means life itself. It is only as we comprehend that situation that we really begin to understand the importance of bread, not only now, but also in the, in the time of Jesus as well. Just think for a moment how so many significant theological events in the Bible revolve around the subject of bread. First of all, the most important event in the Old Testament, of course, was the Exodus event, that trip from Egypt to the Promised Land. But what caused the Hebrew people to move to Egypt in the first place? Well, it was simply because there was a famine. The crops had failed. They had nothing to make the bread with. And so they migrated to the land of the pharaohs because they had heard that there was, there was a great surplus of wheat down there. It was bread or the lack of it that initiated that, that whole chain of events. And later, as, as Allah read for us this morning, when the Jews were on their way to the promised land and they were facing starvation in the bleak wilderness, God rained down bread from heaven, as it was called, in the form of manna. And think about this. When Jesus began his ministry, he went into the desert where he was tempted by the devil. And as the sun beat down on him, he looked out with sweaty eyes at the round white rocks and we're told that they took on the appearance of loaves of bread. And Satan was tempting Jesus to give bread to the people and end the suffering of world hunger. Yet Jesus resisted that temptation because he saw that man cannot live by bread alone. And one day, Jesus was praying by the roadside when the disciples walked up and saw him. And they were so impressed by the genuineness of his prayer that they implored him, Master, teach us how to pray. And it was in the midst of the Master's prayer that he reminds of the importance of the stuff of life. For we say, as we have done and do each Sunday, give us this day our daily bread. Perhaps supremely, we remember bread because it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he met with his disciples in that event that, that we call the Last Supper or Holy Communion. And as he did so remember, he took a loaf of bread and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, 
This is my body, which is given for you. We simply cannot escape the significance of bread throughout the length and breadth of our Judea Christian heritage. Preceding that reading from John this morning, there is that lovely story of how Jesus fed 5,000 people on just five barley loaves and two small fish. It was, in fact, the packed lunch of a little boy who happened to be there. And from that meager supply of bread, Jesus is able to feed the vast multitude that had assembled. And after this event, Jesus goes into his teaching. But there is an issue. His miracle has generated controversy. Quite impressed with what they have seen, a group of scribes approach Jesus and say, in effect, if you are the Messiah, prove it. They point out that the Hebrews were in the wilderness. Moses was able to bring down bread from heaven. And since that time, since that time, there has been a strong rabbinic belief that when the Messiah came, he too would bring manna from heaven. This, if you like, had been the Superman act of Jesus, or sorry, of Moses. And surely they reasoned the Messiah could surpass that. In other words, the Jews were challenging Jesus to substantiate his claim of Messiahship by raining bread from heaven. And here, of course, when we mention bread, we should be thinking of all food in general. Some might immediately say, well, <clears throat> was not the feeding of, of 5,000 a, a miracle in their eyes? Well, yes, it was. But they were impressed, no doubt about that. But you see, Jesus' critics, they argued that he had merely, I love that word, merely fed only 5,000 people, whereas Moses had fed a nation. Jesus, they said, had fed those people for one day. But Moses had fed that nation for 40 years. What you have done is multiply, in their thinking, a few earthly loaves of bread and fish. But Moses made it appear out of nowhere. The Messiah, it was thought at the time, could outperform the signs of Moses. He who was to come would do superior work. And so Jesus meets these expectations by saying that they have misinterpreted the Moses event. First of all, he reminds them the bread didn't come from Moses. The bread came from God. They were putting the emphasis in the wrong place. Moses, if you like, was the facilitator but not the originator. <clears throat> and secondly, Jesus said, they failed to see that the real bread from heaven was not manna at all. That was only meant to be a symbol of the true bread. The real bread from heaven comes down and feeds not only man's physical hunger, but also his spiritual hunger as well. And it was at this point, and don't miss the significance of this, Jesus said, I, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. So bread is central to the major stories of the Bible. And it plays a significant role in life. But we must understand first that to satisfy our hunger for heaven... We cannot eat just the bread of this earth. And that's obvious, I hope. Jesus was saying that they were putting too much emphasis on physical bread. That is not to say it's not insignificant. It's not. Don't under misunderstand him. Supplying physical needs is important. It's very important. But what Jesus is saying here is that there is a deeper aspect to this whole issue. Let's for a moment look back 
200 years before Jesus came on the scene. The Roman emperor in those days was a man called Aurelian. And he initiated something that was called the bread dole. And this meant that grain would be supplied to the poor for half the normal selling price. And this, this dole quickly became a political tool to be used by successive emperors to buy voters, to become a political tool. If Jesus were not careful, this whole thing of giving bread could quickly degenerate into a tool to win friends and influence people. And if that were to happen, he would become just another demagogue, just another politician. Throughout history, food has been used as a weapon. If one country withholds oil from us, for example, then we will we withhold bread and food from them. On the surface, feeding the world's hungry sounds like such a great idea. But when this whole issue is examined, it becomes much more complex. The temptation to give bread to the world was perhaps the greatest that Jesus ever experienced because his great compassionate heart would have melted at the sight of those who were hungry and so many of whom were children. With a snap of a finger, he could have done it without any problems. He could have done it. But Jesus understood the ramifications of this and did what he had to do by refusing to fall into that tempting trap. Yes, bread plays a significant role in every country and in every life. But we must understand that to satisfy our hunger for heaven, we must eat the bread of heaven. Jesus was saying, well, while life in its most elementary form depends upon bread, bread only sustains life. It does not make life what God intended it to be. Bread has the power, but in the end its power will fail. Bread, it can buy you land, but it cannot buy you love. It can buy you hospitals, but it can't buy you health. It can buy you houses, but not homes. It can buy hotels, but not heaven. To satisfy your hunger for heaven, you cannot eat just the bread of earth. You must eat the bread of God. And that bread is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So let us, my friends, this day partake of that food which does not perish. Let us partake of the bread that is not here today and gone tomorrow. Let us partake of the staff of life which nourishes us for all eternity. To satisfy our hunger for heaven, we cannot eat just the bread of earth. To satisfy our hunger for heaven, you must eat the bread of heaven. And what is that bread? Well, Jesus himself, I am the bread of life. And he who comes to me will never go hungry. He is the bread of life, now and forever. Amen. Our offertory hymn is number 578. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. 578. <laughs>
Of we have an announcement to make. Today has been a very strange day in church. Um, got some good news, some sad news. Good news is we got a reward during the week from the Reverend Synod, and he's well enough to come back to the parish next week. So next Sunday he'll be here um, and in Mulligas, and in the following week he's going to be in Ballymar and Balik, and from then on he'll be back full time. His under amended duties, we're not sure 100% yet which way amended duties works, but he, he's well enough to come back and take our services once again. So that's, that's good news. The sad news is we'll have to say farewell to this wee man. Two and a half years ago, Gerald came to the parish group to support the Reverend Senate and to help us all out and supply us with ministry. And right from the very start, I think I'm speaking on behalf of everybody that Gerald fitted into the church family here uh, very easily. During that time, he's helped us with and ministered over most of our major services. And the outstanding ones are probably a Harvest Remembrance Day. And the, we had a Thanksgiving service for the late Queen's Platinum Jubilee, which Gerald put together himself. And um, it was a, one of those memorable occasions. And who will ever forget them hot night sweets on Christmas morning and Easter eggs on Easter day. And in fact, the sermon on the penny at Children's Day had passed there. So Gerald has really put his heart and soul into supporting us as a parish. And for that, we thank him very much indeed. He's been very understanding and empathetic of our needs as a parish. He's com compassionate and courteous to each and every one of us. And if I can say it personally, Gerald, I'd like to thank you very much because you've been very, very easy to work with. And, but above all, what you've come here, you've done and you've preached, as you did this morning, with complete sincerity. He's been an absolute, all round, very genuine person. I think around these words, just turn around and say, he's a good skin, and certainly he is. The re Gerald's not just going because Alan's coming back. The diocese is under severe pressure with parishes having no, no rectors. I think there's something like two dozen churches with no rector in the, in the diocese group. Gerald is going to remain on that rota. So, um, we may actually see you back sometime to cover sicknesses or cover holidays or something like that. So it's not quite goodbye yet. It's more or less, we'll see you later, maybe. So, um, but on behalf of each and every one of us and all associated with Christchurch, Gerald, thank you very, very much for your support over the last two and a half years. And in the words of Nehemiah, twisted slightly, we will remember you for your good and all that you've done for this people. I'm going to ask now the church wardens to come forward, make a wee small token presentation to Gerald on behalf of each and every one of us. Thank you. Small token of appreciation. Thank you. All that you've done. And you're would be very welcome back either as a minister or even as a member of our own congregation at any service. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. I okay. second that. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I don't like me to be lost for words, but Trevor, uh, thank you very much for your for your kind words. It has been two and a half years um, of, of coming here to the, the four churches and, and, uh, and helping out, supporting, supporting Alan, and then having to step up and do a wee bit more while he's been off sick. But we do wish him every blessing uh, as he comes back into harness. Um, I think he's starting off a wedding on Thursday and then he's back in, in church on, on Sunday, and uh, each Sunday after that. And, and I hope he, he's back to full health and also his wife Anne as well, who as you know, has had some health issues as well. Um, I have enjoyed it, and that's put it simply. In fact, I've loved it coming here. You've made me feel so welcome. You have supported me. You have said different things to me going out and so on. And it's lovely. And I will miss it. I will miss every one of you in all four churches. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. So we'll finish with God's blessing upon us all as we leave his house. So God of grace go with you. Christ's goodness be about you. The Spirit's guidance lead you that you may walk in the way of peace. 
and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon each and every one of you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.